Hi, and welcome to the Pink Movement Podcast with your host, Christy Collier. Each episode, you'll hear from some awesome people in and around the breast cancer world, sharing their wisdom on all things health and well-being. You'll hear simple information, practical advice, and useful tips to help you stress less, move more, and feel better. Please note that this podcast contains general information only and should not be treated as medical advice. Hi everyone and thanks for joining me on episode 19 of the Pink Movement podcast. My name is Christy Collier and I am the host of this podcast. Now just a friendly reminder that for every podcast episode, there's a web page which has all the show notes, information and links that you need. So just in case you miss something when you're listening or you just want to go back and find out some info on a particular topic, head on over to thepinkmovement.com.au and check them out. I'm also now publishing a fortnightly blog on the site, which is really exciting. I'm essentially using inspiration from the podcast themselves, the amazing guests I have on and all the great information they share. So again, if this is something you might be interested in, pop on over to the website and have a look. Now, today's episode is all about navigating survivorship. A survivorship essentially kicks in from the day our treatments and surgeries finish. And whether we like it or not, and despite what many others may think, that phase stays with us for the rest of our lives. I'm chatting in this episode with psychologist Sue Nash, who has come from a background of being a breast care nurse for over 12 years. So there's no doubt Sue has a complete and utter understanding of what it's like for us to go through breast cancer. Sue shares with us her top 10 tips and recommendations for navigating survivorship, why it's important and how we can do it. We chat about lots of things like fear of recurrence, learning how to deal with our inner critic and understanding our values and how we want to live our lives post breast cancer. There's so much great info in this episode. So grab a cuppa, put your feet up, have a listen and take it all in. If you've ever thought about wanting to work with a psychologist who completely understands breast cancer, then I have found the perfect person. Sue Nash was a breast care nurse for 12 years at the Royal Women's Hospital in Randwick, Sydney. With a passion for psychology, she continued her studies whilst working at the hospital and graduated as a psychologist in 2014. Understandably, Sue has a special interest in working with those following a cancer diagnosis, dealing with the effects of treatments and surgeries, and then the survivorship phase. Here to talk to us today about all things navigating survivorship, please welcome to the podcast, Sue Nash. Hi, Christy. Thanks for having me. Pleasure and welcome. It's great to have you on board, Sue. We, I thought we might just start off just learning a little bit more about you, um, yourself and your background and how you came to getting where you are today. Sure. Uh, it's a bit of a long story, so I'll keep it short. Um, I actually wanted to be a psychologist when I was a teenager. I was one of those people who knew exactly what they wanted to do. Um, and unfortunately, my parents didn't agree with me, and so they talked me out of it at that time. However, I became a nurse, which was fantastic as well, but I, I ended up um, working in the community as a nurse in Melbourne, and I discovered during that role that there were a lot of women who basically got sent home from hospital following a mastectomy with, with virtually no support. Um, this was back in the days before breast care nurses actually became a thing. Uh, yeah, um, so yeah, so I developed a real interest there and did some further study. I think I did a Master of Nursing way back then. This is, this is in the late 90s. And then the Breast Care Nurse role actually evolved around about the same time. So I worked in that role in Melbourne and then I moved to Sydney and that's how I got the, the role at the Royal Hospital for Women. Um, and I just, I, my passion for psychology continued um, and I studied part-time whilst working full-time. And then now this, this is how I got here, I guess. I graduated in 2014 and working now in private practice and school counselling. Fantastic. And obviously, I mean, psychology is obviously something you're very passionate about by the sounds of it. Yeah, look, I feel like it's 
I guess it's good to work um, in an area that you love and I always knew I wanted to work with people. I just didn't know exactly how my career would go and what it would involve and, and that's pretty much what I did. In the breast cancer role, I worked mostly one-on-one -on -one with women um, and was exactly what I wanted. Um, however, I did, you know, I, have a, I had a desire to continue that passion with psychology. And how did you, you obviously enjoyed working in that role as a, as a breast care nurse. I did a podcast a few episodes ago with one of the McGrath breast care nurses and obviously I've had experience, you and I have crossed paths before and <laughs> I've worked with your colleague, a breast care nurse, Jill, and it's just such a, it's a, it's a tough, tough job, but you know, it's clearly very rewarding job as well. Yeah, look, obviously it's a tough, it's a tough job and it can be, there's lots of emotional um, stuff that goes with it, um, obviously with, with patients, but as well as, um, you know, personally, you, you feel a lot of it, you can't, you can't help that. But I guess it's, I also always viewed it as a real privilege. It was an absolute privilege to sit beside women as they were diagnosed and when they were going through what they were going through, which as you know, you know, is, is very up and down and can be quite traumatic. Um, so I found it, I, I always viewed it as just an absolute privilege to, to be witness to that and to really be able to support support women as they went through it. Yeah, it's an interesting way to frame it, isn't it, that you feel privileged to do that. I'm sure many of the women that you helped felt privileged to have you helping them. So it's definitely <laughs> a two-way street in that space. And obviously that background and experience as a breast care nurse has given you such insight into that area leading into your, you know, your practice in psychology as well to work with those types of people. Oh, absolutely. And, and that's a big reason why, um, although I've left that role now and, and now a psychologist, I've it turned my attention again to supporting those women because I feel that's where I have a lot of skill and experience and, and why would I turn away from that? So I, I'm bringing it all together now, which, which feels amazing. So I'm really happy to do that. Brilliant. Um, and obviously today we're going to talk about the topic of navigating survivorship. So I know, you know, I've done a lot of podcasts about getting through treatment and dealing with treatment and those types of things. So this is a really interesting one, which is really we're talking about what would you describe as the survivorship phase, I suppose, to start with for our listeners? Uh, oh, I, I don't know. I, I guess it's from the day treatment finishes um, and, and beyond. Um, the phase probably never ends. Um, because I think once someone has been diagnosed, and, and you would be able to answer this better than I, I could, it, it, it's something that is always there that has happened. Um, so it, 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 like every other experience in life, it, it, it sort of moves towards shaping you in a different way in how your life is there and then. And, you know, people have a variety of responses to that, to that phase as well, and I guess that's part of what we'll be talking about. It definitely, I mean, I think you've, you've made a good comment there, the day treatment finishes and beyond. And it, it is very much so that when you have been diagnosed with breast cancer and gone through the treatments and surgeries and so on, it does. It is with you for the rest of your life in some way, shape, or form, whether that be in a physical, physical way, or a mental way, or, or whatever it is. I think I sort of say in one of my things where you know whether I like it or not, it's always going to be part of my life now. So mm -hmm. yeah, you have to accept that in some way, shape, or form, and and do what you can with that. With, with you know everybody's different, but that navigating survivorship is so important because. It doesn't matter if you're one year post breast cancer or 20 years post breast cancer. We're all at some phase where though everybody who's in that in that area has had a breast cancer diagnosis, and we do have to navigate survivorship pretty much every day now for the rest of our life. So, uh, absolutely, absolutely true, and and that's why I think it's it's not a forgotten topic. There's quite a lot of research on survivorship, um, but it's putting that support and those resources into action is actually quite hard. And for people to find those resources or to know how to deal with those emotions that come up in survivorship, that, that's where I think there's a bit of a gap. Mm. And, and to be honest, there's not a whole lot out there about the whole survivorship phase. There's a huge amount about getting through treatment and getting through surgeries and the other elements of, of a breast cancer um, journey, so to speak. But that survivorship phase is probably the least well publicized and probably the least amount of information yes. out there yeah yeah absolutely yeah so it's a really important thing for people to uh i guess to know that there is 
things that you can do to, to ease the load. Yeah. So you've actually written a blog post on this topic, which is um, navigating survivorship, and in it you listed 10, I suppose, tips, we'll call them tips, um, to help us navigate through this, the survivorship phase. So what we're going to do today is um, we're going to hear from you on those 10 tips um, and we'll get you to run through them for us. So why don't you kick it off? Sure. Um uh, there's probably more than 10 overall, but I've tried to narrow it down to and, and talk a little bit broadly about each one to incorporate other things. Um, but, but basically, um, the 10 tips I put together obviously have come, I'd say, mainly from my nursing experience and, and knowing what I witnessed um, seeing women going through the process, but also now as a psychologist with um, a diff- it's sort of different perspective. And so it's co- I guess it's coming from both perspectives. Um, so the first tip that I have um, written is to make and maintain connections. And I think I'll put that as number one because I think having social connections is is so important in all aspects of our life, whether or not we're going through breast cancer. I think having that um, connection with others and, and sort of nurturing those relationships is incredibly important for survival for in, in any way, shape or form. Um, so... In my tip, I've talked a little bit about, you know, maintaining connections with family and friends um, and, you know, participating in community or social groups. Uh, uh, and if people aren't part of those social groups, perhaps thinking of moving into such groups if they're interested in doing something like that. And doing these things can help people feel connected with others, can give them purpose depending on the, the nature of the social group. Um, and it also just opens up that, I guess walking side by side with other people and, and having um, the ability to open up if you need to and just, just people having your back. Um, and obviously one of the, like a really good group to be part of is, is if you've had breast cancer and you're in that survivorship phase is being in contact with other survivors. Um, that Some people... A real, like really reach out for that kind of thing and others shy away from it. But I do believe that that's where people get the most support, you know, just having having those people in their life that really know what they're going through and really know what they're saying when they when they talk about a particular emotion or symptom and, and people who have been through breast cancer really get that, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I do. I mean, obviously, uh, I'm a part of the Dragons of Breast group and I paddle with Dragons of Breast Sydney and that group is exactly what you've just suggested there. It's a group of women who are all breast cancer survivors, majority of which are in the survivorship phase, anywhere from one year post-treatment up to 20 years post-treatment. And there is something to be said for being in it, and it's a face-to-face group every week in a group of women that completely understand what you've been through. Mm. We all share a connection Almost, we say, unfortunately, but fortunately, because we share a connection with these amazing women. And I, you know, I see these women as such a huge part of my life now. And I feel very fortunate to be part of this group. And that, you know, that sounds a bit strange, but I completely understand (laughs) that because sometimes we go to, you know, we have, we paddle on Saturday mornings and we go to breakfast after. And sometimes we'll talk about breast cancer for the whole morning and then we won't speak about it for three months. But when we do speak mm. about it, everybody has a real understanding and empathy for it. And it, it, it is a very unique environment, but, but I can understand why you would say that. Yeah, absolutely. And our Dragons of Rest have been around for a while. They're fantastic. I, we did a couple of paddles with them and they're an amazing bunch of women. So I'm glad you're with them. That's great to hear. Okay, so, so tip one is to make and maintain connections. Tip two. Tip two is... Uh, look after your symptoms, there is help. So that's alluding to the fact that, you know, there is a bit of an assumption that when you finish treatment, everything's fine. But unfortunately, that's not exactly true. People have ongoing symptoms and things going on as a result of the treatment. Um, and people, women can feel quite lost um, in terms of the fact that they've finished everything and they feel like perhaps they've been a bit forgotten and they, they've got no longer got the right to contact health professionals in terms of um, things that they're struggling with. Uh, so it's really just 
pointing out that there is still help available for any symptoms that you might be experiencing or emotional emotional problems that you might have as well, things that you may be stuck on. Um, it's okay to reach out for help. It's okay to contact people and ask, you know, what, what can I do about this particular problem? Um, often the GP becomes a lot more important in this phase as well, and it depends on your particular GP and the way they practice, but they can often become a really good source of support and knowledge about what's in the local community um, in terms of, you know, psychologists or um or particular physios that may specialise in a particular area like lymphedema. Uh, and also, yeah, just being connected, you can connect up with all the um, the council type resources like Breast Cancer Network and Cancer Council. So they often have information on survivorship as well. But it's really just reminding people that you still have the right to receive help um, for the for any kind of symptoms that you have. Yeah, it's interesting. I, uh, we popped a post on Facebook a little while ago about breast cancer-related fatigue and I had a lot of ladies comment on that, noting that it lingers <laughs> for many, many, yeah. many years and for some it might be there forever. And it's very hard for someone who's not been through breast cancer to perhaps understand that, that there yeah. is ongoing perhaps fatigue or there is ongoing physical pain from surgery or sites mm. or you know, lymphedema, of course, there's ongoing emotional, uh, you know, issues or things that you need to deal with always that will go on through your life. So I do like that tip in that just because you're finished and you might, again, be one, five, ten years down the track, you still need to look after yourself and if there are symptoms, make sure that you get help. Mm, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, tip three. Tip three is uh, avoid viewing problems as impossible. So I guess what I'm talking about there is, um, it, I guess it's mindset and, and acceptance. Yeah, so it's basically looking at what do you have control over in terms of um, what has happened to you. So sometimes stressful things happen and bad things happen to people and part of those problems we don't have control over, some of them we do. So it's, it's the tip is really about looking at things from a different perspective um, and rather than looking at it as something that you can't possibly do anything about, it's looking at it from, I guess, fresh eyes and looking at what you can actually do, what can you problem solve, you know, how can you control the stress relating, that, relating to that um, problem. You know, sometimes stress is trying to tell you something. Uh, can I do something? Can I contact someone? Somebody, can I perhaps put some steps into place that will help me resolve certain aspects of this problem? And then learning to be a little bit more accepting, not liking, but accepting of things that have happened um, and being able to move on from those or just viewing them from a little bit of a different perspective in terms of, um, uh, yeah, I guess taking the emotional element of, of what you're looking at. So you're looking at the problem from the perspective of something that happened and um, what can I do about it and you make steps to do that and then the other aspect is you, you accept what's happened and it, it does sit there and you live with it but rather than being looking at it from an angry or a really stressed perspective it's, it's accepting that there is stress and there is anger um, and just turning your attention gently to things that make your life meaningful. Okay, I really like that, that that notion of accepting because especially, you know, following a breast cancer diagnosis, as you say, some things are in your control. There are a lot of things out of your control. So that, you know, being accepting, which is obviously easier said than done, but also I like your suggestion about really being a problem solver. So if something is an issue and you can take steps to fix it or just improve it, then instead of focusing on the problem, try and find some solutions, you know, things that can work towards improving that for you. Um, That's where you may be able to get help from a psychologist. So you can, you can get help in building your skills in problem solving. Um, also mindfulness, it's sort of being mindful of where your mind is taking you. Is my mind taking me down that path of being, you know, really angry and really um, like just not in a problem solving frame of mind or is it, you know, and, and being mindful of being in the here and now, not not sort of linking it to the past or the future. 
Okay, so step three is avoid viewing problems as impossible and try to be accepting and, and be a problem solver. Um, step four, tip four. Uh, well, I mean, I sort of moved into that, but that is accepting change as part of life. Um, so accepting situations that can't be changed can help you focus on circumstances that you can change. So I guess three and four sort of blur together a little bit. Um, and again, just reminding people that acceptance doesn't mean liking something. It just means being willing to have those that situation in your life and willing to have the feelings and emotions that go along with it. Um, so that's pretty much what that point means. In your in the previous tip, you mentioned something in your actual blog post about allocating worry time. Can you tell us a bit oh, about yeah. that? Yeah. So. Um, I mentioned that, you know, sometimes stress can be your friend, uh, that you can use that stress to to motivate you to get something done. Um, and for some, like, one particular strategy that someone might find helpful is when you find yourself worrying um, over and over about something, one way to, to help you move away from that is to actually allocate some worry time. And that might be that you actually allocate half an hour to really sit down and think about what you're worrying about, what is the problem, what can I do, and actually making it a useful time. And then after the however however long the allocated time is, when you've finished that worry time, you are able to sort of put it away in a bit of a mental bucket where you don't have to access it. And if you feel your mind taking you back there, it's like this gentle pull back to the here and now. It's great in theory. Does it work? <laughs> oh, it, like anything else, it takes it, – it's no. Everything <laughs> everything's easier said than done. Yeah. But it, look, it, it can, that particular strategy can work for some people. Yeah, yeah it does work, but it, but it takes practice. Sure. Um, and, you know, if somebody doesn't particularly find that strategy useful, then we would come up with something else to, to help that individual. Yeah, I mean, it's great. I, I love the the idea of it, which is set aside 15 minutes, chuck all your worries into that time and give it a go. And as you say, if you practice, you know, practice makes perfect. So you, if you wanted to try something like that, definitely give it a go. Yeah, for sure, yeah. for sure. Okay, so tip four was accepting change as part of life. Tip five. Tip five is um, identify what is important for you now. And so what I mean in that tip is that once you've had a breast cancer diagnosis and you're in the survivorship phase, um, it can, it, for a lot of women, it can leave you in a type of existential crisis. Who am I? What am I doing here? What's my purpose in life? Those sort of things. And, and everything that used to be important to you, may not may not have the same importance and there's a bit there, there may be a bit of a shift so true. <laughs> um yeah and it can be really good like it can be a really good thing but obviously for that to happen there there has to be a lot of soul searching and and what i think is really important here is knowing what your what is what your values are what makes your life fulfilling and meaningful and it can be a very difficult question for some people, but it's really looking at, um, you know, what kind of things, and it's not like goals, it's not like I want to earn $100,000 a year. It's more about if you value work, um, you like, you, what, you have to have a job that you love, that kind of thing, or you want to work these hours. Um, and with people who have been through breast cancer, I guess it's um, it, it obviously very individual, but it may make you reassess what's important to you in terms of relationships. You know, it might um, it might make you review what's important for you in, in a work situation because you may not be able to do the same job in the same capacity as you were doing prior to your diagnosis. And as you said before, that the, if you've got fatigue issues, that can really affect your, in, your income and your, I guess, your ability to work uh, whatever hours you want to work. So it's really talking about um, what are your values because if you know what's important to you in life, then that really helps to guide you every day. Every day what you do, is this taking me towards my values? You know, is, is this, why am I doing this? And that can just help make every single day meaningful because it means you're living your life according to this life compass that's, that's incredibly important to you as an individual. 
Um, and so I guess my point there is that you, it, sometimes your values might shift slightly. They probably still have the same values, but it might be that a particular facet to that value is a little bit more important to you now, considering what you've been through. It definitely makes you reassess everything following a breast cancer diagnosis and you speak about your values and your purpose in life and what's important to you or you know almost everybody I've spoken to that's been through breast cancer goes through that at some point in life because very few times in your life are you faced with you know to put it in a harsh way your own mortality we it's the first time for for a lot of us we would have ever had to think about anything like that so you're forced to think about my values and what's important to me in my life and and most people do make some changes in what it, as we say everybody is individual um but yeah it's a really it's a really good point sue and certainly something that a lot of women experience and go through yeah absolutely absolutely and um it can also help you just develop goals and achievable goals and and plans I guess in terms of where you want to go and what you want to do and again that problem solving comes in as well um so yeah I do think that's a really important important point for sure Mm. so tip five is identify what's important for you now tip six tip six is a bit of an extension on tip five and that is that you live your values every day um, so my point here is that you don't have to wait until all your pain or difficult experiences are gone before you start living a rich and meaningful life. Um, so I think it's really important to know that you don't have to have you don't have to have one or the other. You know you can't you don't have to wait to actually find out or really delve into what your values are and what you want your life to be like. You can do it even whilst you're in the midst of a crisis, for example. Um, so uh, the example I've given. Um, you know, it might be that you value good health. That might be a very common one um, in the survivorship phase. And so I make the point here of, um, you know, you, rather than wanting to lose 10 kilograms, so I must diet and lose 10 kilograms. That's a bit, a bit of a harsh rule that we place on ourselves. And then that just leads to disappointment and frustration that you can't get there very easily, um, especially with a lot, often some of the, the drugs post-cancer treatment people can be on. It's very difficult to lose weight sometimes. Um, so talking about that would be a goal rather than a value. So the value there might be that I really just want to be healthy and I want to lower my risk of breast recurrence by maintaining a normal weight. Um, so it's a, it's a different perspective than, than having these you know, often unachievable goals that we just place so much pressure on ourselves. Um, If you enjoy, um, you want a healthy body and you want to reduce your risk, then getting out there and enjoying the fresh air, you know, going for a swim in the ocean, things like that that make your life meaningful and, and fulfilled. Yeah, I love it. So living your values every day as best that you can, I suppose. Absolutely, yes. Okay, tip seven. Uh, tip seven, I, again, everything links in, but I've put here looking for opportunities, look for opportunities for self-discovery. Um, and I think the point there is that um, people who have suffered hardship um, or tragedies or something like a breast cancer diagnosis can can often use that, I guess, values clarification to... Um, to improve their life and they often do report improvement in aspects such as relationships or being able to make clearer decisions, being more assertive, things like that. So it can actually um, be a process of self-discovery for a lot of people. Again, knowing what your values are and what's important to you, that might inspire someone to go off and do that course that they always wanted to do and never made time for. Um, you know, I guess carpe diem, you know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's that kind of message, I guess, that you know, use that that experience um, and that you know renewed knowledge of what's important to you to to inspire you to do different things and things that make you happy. Yeah, and it's very true because you, following a breast cancer diagnosis, you kind of always have this thing in your mind, even though it's actually not. But life is short; just get out there and do things and I think I certainly found that sort of renewal in myself and I know a lot of others have as well a renewed 
almost zest for life and willingness to try new things and do new things and experiences. And I think in a you know weird sort of way, it's one of the positive things that you get out of going through something like breast cancer. Oh, absolutely. What's that quote? I think it's through adversity comes strength, something like that. Something like um, that. It's, that <laughs> it's true. It's true. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Okay, so tip seven was look for opportunities for self-discovery. Tip eight. Tip eight is nurture a positive view of yourself. Um, so um, I just feel that people can use the experience to to de- to look at what they want, develop more confidence in your ability to problem solve, trust your instincts, back yourself, um, and just linking this back to what your values are. You know, who or what do you want to stand for in life? Do you value being kind and generous? So, it's, again, it's nurturing things that... Um, I guess, sit with you and make you your unique self. So it's nurturing that, nurturing that process. And when you say sort of nurturing a positive view of yourself, you're not talking physically, you're talking about the, the things that are that are good about you as a person and, and recognising them and valuing them. I think we all have a bit of an inner critic sometimes. Um, and, you know, you, I guess my point here is to be mindful of what you what you find your mind telling you sometimes. And that can be, oh, you're hopeless or I'm just not worthy of this. Or it, it, we all do it. We all have it. And it's, I think, being able to recognise that little voice that sometimes is probably like a little overly helpful friend that's not very helpful. Yes. Thinks they're very helpful, but they're not. And... It's very common that we can actually be guided by that that little critic that tells us that we're hopeless, that we're no good. Um, so I think really what I'm trying to um, express here is that recognizing that little voice and trying to, I guess, stand up to it in a way and just say no, I, I that's not true, and thank 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 you, mind, for tell, taking me down that path. But I think I'm just gonna sit with how I'm a good person, I am worthy, that, yeah, you get the idea that it's just it's just being able to recognise that little voice when it comes along and to to turn away from it, I guess. Yeah, it's we all, we all have that inner critic. Everybody has it in some way, shape or form in some areas of their life and I think a lot of us recognise it but it's so hard to shut it down sometimes. It is hard to shut it down and, and I work very much... A, um, a therapy called acceptance and commitment therapy and that's one of the big things that that I do is is helping people to step up like recognize the voice when it is and step away from it and observe it getting hooked into that whole dialogue um, and it is a skill and it's 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 fairly easy to learn and it's very powerful in helping you to to recognize what your mind kind of does to try to protect you All right, so tip eight was nurturing a positive view of yourself. Let's move on to tip nine. Uh, So tip nine is to keep things in perspective. So what I'm alluding to here is the pesky old fear of recurrence, which is obviously incredibly common um, and probably the most difficult of the ongoing fallout from breast cancer. Um, That fear of recurrence can hit at any time and is different for everybody. Um, so, and I've, in, in the tip on the, in the blog post, I talk about the 12 month anniversary, which I know is a really difficult time for most women, um, when they're reminded of everything they went through the, in the previous 12 months or however many years ago. Um, and often they have to have, um, some sort of follow up or, you know, imaging to, to just check everything's okay, but it brings up a, a lot of emotion. Um, for some women, that fear of recurrence is is really heightened, um, and not necessarily related to their risk. It's it's got to do with um, just how every individual is 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 moving through survive, the survivorship phase. So I guess keeping it in perspective, um, you know, in therapy, I would help people to build skills to take a bit of a different stance towards those emotions as they appear. Um, like not to get you, you'd never get rid of the fear of recurrence because again, in a way, I would I would never call it a good thing, but in a way, it's reminding you that you need to keep in check. You know, you need to go and get checked up. So, um, I wouldn't call it exactly your friend because it can be quite um, difficult to to move through. But um, 
yeah, I think it's it's putting it into perspective. And, and if, if you are really struggling with that, that's something that um, there is help available in terms of what uh, what skills you can build to, to cope better with those painful thoughts and emotions that come with it. Uh, so, but it's, yeah, it's keeping it in perspective and for some people that's easier said, easier said than done. Um, and they're the people who may actually need further assistance in trying to deal with um, their fear of recurrence. So tip nine was keep things in perspective as, as best that you possibly can. Tip 10. Tip 10 is to be self-compassionate. So what I mean here is that we can often, I think we can often be quite judgmental with ourselves about how we respond to things. And so it's really being kind to ourselves in terms of, you know, what as individuals we have been through. So for women who have been through breast cancer, um, you know, it's, it's being very understanding that it's okay, it's not pleasant, but it's okay and understandable to have painful feelings, thoughts, emotions and memories. Um, as much as you'd like to fight them and get rid of them, Sometimes they just appear, they come up out of the blue, something might trigger it. Um, and rather than getting really angry that you're still feeling like this, it's much easier to, um, again, easier said than done, but a better strategy is to be accepting of those, those thoughts and feelings do come up occasionally. Um, but also to be very kind to yourself and self-compassionate about what you have been through. And, and that, yes, you know, the, the, the painful feelings and emotions are a testament to how much you value your life. Uh, so I guess, yeah, my point is just to be very kind to yourself about um, the way you feel and things that happen and emotions that pop up for people, which can be quite painful. So don't give yourself a hard time when that happens. Don't. Absolutely, absolutely, exactly. Okay. All right, well, I'll just do a quick summary of the 10 tips that we talked about here today, Sue. To Sue. So tip one was make and maintain connections. Tip two was look after your symptoms because there is help no matter where you are in your survivorship phase. Tip three is avoid viewing problems as impossible and look at ways to solve them if you can. Tip four is accepting change as a part of your life. Tip five is identifying what's important for you right now, which is looking at those values. And tip six is then live your values every day. Tip seven was look for opportunities for self-discovery. Tip eight was nurture a positive view of yourself. Tip nine was keep things in perspective. And then tip 10 was be self-compassionate. So lots of tips and advice there for all of those listeners who are currently in the survivorship phase. But I suppose with a lot of that we spoke about today, Sue, like we sort of mentioned a couple of times, a lot of it is easier said than done. So if anybody listening would like to work with you in particular, where could they get in contact with you? Okay. Um, so I have a website, uh, which is basically www.outlookpsychology.com phone or email I've got a Facebook page um, so either any of those um, avenues to contact me is absolutely fine fantastic and you are doing some work via video link now as well Sue yes I've just started that's an exciting addition to my practice because it just allows a lot more flexibility so I use a, a secure um, video platform it's a company called CoView so it's, uh, it's designed specifically for allied health practitioners that's okay. very secure it's all based in australia so it's really safe and it's just it's just a really um it's a really easy feature actually um and it just yeah allows flexibility for, for people who maybe can't come during office hours uh and i can be very flexible i can do early morning or evening um so that's a really good feature I think that, that sort of I've taken on recently and I'm really happy with that so if people you know are interested in that kind of um, counselling it works quite well and yeah that's available if, if people are interested. Sure I mean obviously you're based in Sydney so for our Sydney listeners yeah. they can certainly get in touch with you but for our other listeners who are sort of based all over Australia and we I know we've got some New Zealand and US listeners and a few bits and pieces if they wanted to get in touch with you they certainly could because as we touched on at the beginning Sue is not just a psychologist she has 
many, many years as a breast care nurse and therefore her understanding of what we've all been through and certainly our, you know, where we're at in survivorship and so on is just so in depth and such a great, um, great person to get in touch with if you, are, if you do need some help in these areas. Obviously, the 10 tips Sue has shared with us today are all brilliant and fantastic. But if you do find that you need a little bit more help and a little bit more guidance and counselling um, and support, then definitely get in touch with Sue. Um, you know, she'd be a wonderful person for you to work with. So, Sue, thank you so much for joining us today. That's been a great chat and lots of great information and advice there for our listeners today. It's been a pleasure having you on the podcast, so thank you so much. Well, thank you, Christy, for having me to this wonderful podcast, and and I hope the listeners enjoy this. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Pink Movement Podcast. For episode notes, links, and downloads, head to thepinkmovement.com.au. Like what you're hearing? Join our Facebook page, subscribe through iTunes, and while you're there, provide a quick review. Want to help out? You can support the ongoing production of this podcast by becoming a patron. Find all the details on the website. The Pink Movement Podcast, helping you to stress less, move more, and feel better.